Lord, on this day, we just recall our uh, only prayer is for you, for your spirit, for your love to take over in this room and wherever others are watching, to give us somehow as frail humans what we do not possess, and that is the grace and the conviction to believe, to believe that you, as the Son of God, can not only heal us of our sins, but put us on a course that will truly bear fruit. So come, Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning and out there. Thank you so much for watching in. Uh, man, there's nothing better than baptism. And that was a bunch of them. It's, uh, I'm glad there's no cameras, kind of, because it can get chaotic back there when you scramble around. I do think I've got somebody else's shirt on from back there, though. Does anybody raise your hand? If you got the wrong shirt on, too. Um, you know, psychologists tell us that we all live by this mental map, and other social scientists do, too. That's what explains why the vast majority of you did not need a GPS to get you here, right? You already knew how to get here. How did you know how to get here? Well, you've been here before, and your mind kind of maps itself to go where you're familiar with. Now, that's the spatial understanding of how things ought to operate around you. There's an expectation when you come down Central Avenue, you will see this church building. Now, it washes over into a lot of other areas of life, too, even on a global scale. What we see with Russia and Ukraine is an indication of that. Cross the territory, that should be our place. No, it shouldn't. We have the rightful... Uh, Israel and the Gaza Strip are two examples of that also. Centuries-old fight over a borderline and a territory rights of property. We see it all over. In a postmodern, post-truth society, is what everybody pretty much agrees we are in right now, it shows up with a lot of, I had this expectation... I got there, it's nothing like it was. This used to be right, now it's wrong. This used to be wrong, now it's right. Uh, and it disorients us to the point where it creates a lot of anxiety, a lot of anger, a lot of depression, and a, and a whole bunch of other things because we feel like our maps are now being blurred. Now I say this to say I think this has everything to do with Easter because we need some clear mind map, if you will, that we're not necessarily constructing of our own, that we're given by a loving, creative God who loves us so much that he knows what's best for us, and in the, and in the knowing what's best for us, he's actually calling us to him. And that's what Easter is all about. And so... As we move more into this, I'll just, I'm going to throw out a question, which I think we all have to deal with, and then I'm going to throw out a challenge to you, okay? My question is simply this. Where you are today, where you're sitting on your couch at home or where you are right here, would you say, I'm more full or I'm more empty in my soul? Now, Jesus made this promise when he walked in and said, I've come to give you life, but more than just life, the abundant life. That, the other word for that is the full life. So if that's his promise, and some of you, most of you, I hope, believe that he is incapable of going back on a promise, then does that classify me? If we're far from that, that's the challenge for today. You ready for my challenge? My challenge, to borrow a phrase from part of our culture, is be who you are, where you are, if you are. Be who you are, where you are, if you are. And I'll define those three elements more clearly from the Scripture as we get into them. If you have your Bible today, thank you for bringing it. There's a few Bibles in front of you probably and at home. Grab your device or grab your Bible. It's always better to see things. Luke 24, a familiar story to some of you. Maybe not so familiar to some, but I'm glad, I'm glad that you all are here because we spend a lot of our lives looking for meaning and looking for purpose. That is another way of saying that's our mental map. Now, my quick story is I spent half my life working my mental map, and it had nothing to do with God's mental map. 
and I finally realized some changes needed to be made, and it took me far too long to realize that. I don't know if I'm the only one in the room that has gone through that or not, but if, we're more, if we are full grade, if we're more empty, then here's some great encouragement for you. Let me just read through this. Now, can you do me a favor? Everybody in the room and everybody out there, some of you have read this passage 114 times. Can you pretend today that this is the first time you've ever read it? This is like, what? Huh? This is news to you. All right, starting 24 verse 1. On the first day of the week, this is, would be a Sunday, very early in the morning, the women took the spices that they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood before them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful man, be crucified, and on the third day raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the 11, the uh, disciples, and to the others that were there. Verse 10, it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women. Why? Because their words seemed like nonsense. Their mental map, based on what they had seen two days, three days earlier, it just did not compute. Verse 12, Peter, however, got up, ran to the tomb, Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away wondering to himself what had happened. Well, I want to share what I believe to be three great truths with you about this, are we full or are we empty, and then let you make your conclusions on what your next step with the Lord ought to be. Whether you've been a Christ follower for a long, long time or whether it happened yesterday or whether it's not yet happened, our belief here is God has a next step for every one of us because none of us have arrived. If you're a guest today, we're so gl glad to have you. I hope you'll run by the tent. Let us give you something. Let us know who you, how we can pray for you and things like that. But you need to know something. You're surrounded by some of my favorite people, but they're all busted sinful. I am the chief sinner around here because... My, my word tells me that the life of Jesus is who we're comparing to. And so once we get up next to Jesus, we're all pretty much in the same place, right? That's why we all have a next step to take. Created in his image, but far from his image. That's why he created the church. And that's why if you came in here somehow believing I'm not worthy, these guys all know like all the scripture by heart or something like that and their authorities. Oh, no, 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 no. We all have a long way to go, no matter where we are. So let's get that clear right now, because I want you to know who you are, wherever you are, if you are, okay? So let's go. The first great truth is without Jesus, life is empty. That's our whole premise. The reason for Easter is we are empty vessels. We're cracked pots unless Jesus comes and fills us. First Peter 1, 18 and 19 says, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver and gold that you were redeemed from this empty empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers but with the precious blood of Christ a lamb without blemish or defect now this is written by a guy named Peter this is late in his life he's made his share of mistakes he was in the room the night before the crucifixion he he brags about how how loyal he's going to be to Jesus because Jesus has basically called him out and said, you know what, Night, before the night's over, you're going to act like you never even knew me. Oh, no, everybody else can run away. I'll be there with you. And he's feeling for his sword. He's got a little sword, you know. He's like, he's like I will take care of you. I will die with you. And just a couple of hours later, he's denying even knowing Jesus. He is full of remorse and full of guilt. He feels like he's gone too far there is no redemption for him. 
Later, he writes these letters to churches, First and Second Peter, and he is a different cat. He is not the same man. Something has dramatically changed him. It is the power of God through the blood of Jesus, which now operates in the form of the Holy Spirit working inside of him. And he says, well, I just read, he says, you can be redeemed or brought back or pur purchased or emancipated from your sins. We're, hey, y'all, we're all slaves to sin. We all are bound up if we don't have someone coming from heaven to come in and redeem our lives. And that's what he found out. But look at this. He said, from what? The empty way of life handed down to you. So can I be honest and a little bit personal here? Some of you are living a mental map that you have constructed, and it's based on what you think somebody expects of you. And that's a dead-end street. It won't work. Some of you are living a mental map that you're the person you admire who seems to be smarter and more talented and all like that. They're living it, and you're like, well, why can't I? And you're constructing your life based on that. That won't work. The only thing left really truly is to be who you are in the image of God as Jesus rewrites your mental map. That's sooner or later what has to happen. One definition of idolatry is when we leave the pursuit of Jesus for our life and we start to construct our own path and our own future. It may not be desperately wicked. It's just not what you were constructed to do. And so there's always going to be this miss, and you'll never be able to fully say who you are to other people. Who are you? Who are you? And we're going to talk more about that in just, just for a minute. I got good news. Jesus has a map for you already planned out. Says it was there before the beginning of time ever. And so with that, we'll get, we'll get right, we'll get d down into that. Jesus also said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever should believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. But here's the verse right after it we don't read. For God sent his son to the world, not to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So with that, we can get a better understanding. Now, there's a lot going on as every day of the week in the sports world. We can learn some great messages, believe it or not, from the sports world. One football, if you like football, one football celebrity that's been in the news a lot lately, even though it's off season, is Tom Brady. And I think his, his picture's going to come up right now. Tom Brady, as you know, retired at 43, 44 years old the other day. Great career, maybe the greatest quarterback ever in the history of the world, and everybody acknowledges that and everything. He retired, though, still playing at a super high level. And when asked why, of course, he said, hey, it's time. I just need to spend more time with my kids and my family. About 31 days later, he's unretiring. <laughs> One Instagram feed says, you know what? When you have your kids 24-7, it doesn't take long. <laughs> and so it may have been that he decided, you know, that 320-pound guy trying to take my head off is actually easier than... Now, I don't know that. I'm just... But for whatever the reason, he's back. One conjecture is, and only Tom knows, am I so defined by what I do that without what I do, I really don't know who I am? And so there's the re-entry into things. In 2005, there was an interview with him. He was a lot younger then. He had just won his third Super Bowl already, and the interviewer said, wow, you're in the prime of your career, the prime of life. You've already been to Pro Bowls. You've already won three Super Bowls. You signed a huge contract. You got as much money as you'll ever need in your life. Oh, and also, you're married to a smoking hot supermodel who has her own career. Man, you're on top of the world. What's next for you that you could possibly achieve? And he looked down, and he said, I don't know, but there must be something more. There must be something more to this life. 
The interviewer said, what is it? And he said, I wish I knew. Now, I'm not here to, um, to, to speculate whether Tom Brady has a, a spiritual life or any of that stuff. Years later, like in 2018, I did read where he said, spirituality is the core of who we are. I'm not sure what that means. He may be a devoted Christ follower. He may not be. That's not my point. My point is, back then, it was pretty clear that the gold and silver are not what bring purpose and meaning. Can we agree? That there's got to be an internal mechanism, and, and could it be that even at 44 years of age, he's still trying to figure out what his mental map in life truly needs to be? Is your life more full or more empty? There's a second great truth, and that is God's love fills the emptiness. God's love is the, is the first part. Look, back at verse 5 and 6 that we read, there's these two beings. Now, we're going to start a series next week called Seriously, as in, seriously, do you really believe that? And it's about five or six things that a lot of our culture today does not believe that, that we tend to believe here, and one of those is, are there really angels? Are there really good spirits and bad spirits? Now, I believe that there are, and I believe that these two men in white were angels that day, and they, for some reason, drew the good straw. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you like to have been an angel with this job? I tell you what, I brought him back to life, so you go down and you tell everybody that he's not dead, he's living. Man, what a great job. It, for two reasons. One is, I would imagine if I'm an angel, it's kind of fun just to go down and freak people out when you appear. <laughs> and what's even better, in a cemetery you appear. So they say, why are you looking for the living among the dead? And these ladies probably say, well, we're in a cemetery. That's natural. Our mental map says... This is where you see where dead people are, are existing, right? And then he says, he's not here, he has risen. John 3, 16, it's because of his love. Romans 5, 8, Paul, who was converted later in life as an absolute um, persecutor of Christ followers, makes a 180 and says, God so loved you that he demonstrated this love and that while you're still sinners, Christ died, died for you. I got more good news for you. The where you are, being who you are, where you are, means everywhere. In the classroom, at work, with the family, in your, in your downtime, in your neighborhood, at the gym, wherever you are. And one reason is we come to this understanding. He loves you so much. He'll come, he came right where you were. He loves you so much he doesn't want to leave you in the condition you're in. Thank the Lord he didn't leave me in the condition I was in spiritually. I was of no use to him. I'm still, he's still working on me, and he's still working on the people around you. But his love has to be the catalyst for that. If we say I'm becoming full, abundant, we have to have fuel. The fuel is named the love of Jesus Christ. Got it? So we got to check, am I, am, I, am I entering, allowing the fuel to come into me or not? When I was in high school, one of my best friends had this old beat-up, uh, hand-me-down car that was over 20 years old at that time. It was, a, it was a 1963 Rambler station wagon with the luggage rack on the top, and it was green, but it was a rusted-out green to the point that it was just this dull gray. All, all, our ki all the kids at high school said, there goes the grenade. It was about the color of a hand grenade, if that tells you anything. And that thing would run most days, but a lot of things did not operate on it. And so it was kind of a hold your breath anytime he and I would go out. And his gas gauge did not work anymore. And so I'll call him Mark. What Mark would do is he'd carry around this long stick in the back floorboard. And every now and then, he'd go out and he'd jam that stick down the gas thing. And he'd pull it out and he'd look at it and I'd say, how much gas you got? And he'd say, about four inches. <laughs> That'll get us there. And I'm like, well, I hope so. We didn't always make it. There was something else, though. 
that was dicey, his windshield wipers did not work. They were broken. And so one night, we're in downtown Greenville, South Carolina, on Main Street. And back in that day, that's where, pe that's where the cool people went to just go up and down the road, the street, you know? And most of their vehicles were a little bit nicer than ours. And we were sitting there, and it's pouring. It is rain. We can't, see, we can't really see much of anything. Traffic light turns red, and we're both like, thank goodness we get to stop at the light. And Mark, this back when the windows were, you know, roll up and roll down. So Mark rolls his window down like that. And he reaches under his seat and gets a short-handled squeegee. And he goes, some of you are nodding. You've done that. And he gets his windshield wiper. And the funniest thing was the car sitting next to us at the light is this, like, gleaming, shiny Camaro. And the guy driving it, oh, he is, he's beyond cool. He's got a toothpick hanging out of his mouth, and he's, all, and he's watching this whole scene in our rambler. And he's just staring, and Mark happened to catch his eye when he looked, and he goes like this. And so he, yeah, it's me. He's, he rolls his window back up, and then he looks over at the guy and goes, So we had this spatial problem. We weren't sure we had enough fuel to get there most days. And if it was raining, we couldn't even see how to get there most days. That defines where too many of us are. That defines where I used to be. Not sure where I'm going. Not sure if I even got the juice to get there. Thank the Lord that we're not created to be empty. We're created to be, have fuel. We have contaminants, though, that can get into our fuel. That's called the unholiness of life. Christ's love has the ability to filter out even the contaminants, not because of us, but because of Him, and make our fuel more pure to burn for Him, for His glory. And that's when it becomes about other people. The blessed the rest up there means simply whatever room you walk into this week, Look for somebody to bless. Whatever place you are this week, look for somebody to bless with the love of Christ. And that, in effect, will do what we were created to be, is be salt and light in that, in that venture. So where is your travels going to take you? Where does your mental map have you going right now at this trajectory of your life? I love being in this place because there's so many pe people here that inspire the rest of us because they're, they're human like we are, but they seem to be understanding their mental map. So can you show that video? I want to introduce you to one. Same thing, so you're getting uh, the tandem. It just happens naturally, okay, in this. We don't have to think about the tandem. What I was just telling them is with Gavin and Brett, right, ball hits on the right side, what's Gavin already thinking? He's the cut. Right. Brett hears the four call and Brett knows ball's on the right side, I become the cut. Okay, so those two will work in tandem, and now you get Thomas on that side working as a cut. Potentially, if you get a three call, that changes from a four call, okay? okay. All right, all right, here we go. For me, faith is, is who we are. Uh, so it's not necessarily like, how do I bring it into the workplace? It's more so of how does it come out when I'm in the workplace? Uh, how, how do people see that faith? Um, and we know that, that our faith is in Jesus. So how are they seeing Jesus? I really think it's, it's sometimes as simple as a smile to a person that just needed to see a smile or uh, encouraging words to somebody that you can tell is, is not having the greatest day. But uh, I really feel like faith is consistency. Uh, are you consistent? each and every day in your workplace. And, and when you have that consistency, we know it, it doesn't come from us. The consistency it, because of who we are and, and being content in Christ comes from Christ. That faith pours out because Christ is in us. Christ is all we need. We don't, we don't need anything else. Then Beckman. So, 
think you probably figured it out. Brandon is the head baseball coach at Stratford High School, which means he's a teacher. He's also a father, and his daughter was baptized at the last hour, so it's been a big day for the Beckman family. He, he's a husband. He is uh, a coach I've already mentioned, and, and he serves in two or three capacities. You're a teacher of a small group here, right? And recently, you just got named to be chairman of the deacons here. Good night. So, how in the world do you organize all of this? Uh, it's busy, but I think everybody can relate with busy. Um, seems like now life has gotten, like we've got all these like devices <laughs> that seems to make our life, are supposed to make our life simpler, uh, but it hasn't, it's made it more complex. Um, but I think scheduling wise, it's, it's busy. I wake up five o'clock in the morning and now it's baseball season. So normally three nights a week, it's not, you're not done until 10, 30 or 11 o'clock at night. Um, but, but we have time. You, yep. you, you, it's just, you do it. So going way back, was this pretty much the mental map that you laid out for your whole life? Yeah, of course. Of course it was. Uh, <laughs> every, every step along the way. Yeah, no. Um, so probably fifth or sixth grade, I, I felt like, I, man, I want to be a teacher. I want to be a coach. And I think every athlete in here could probably relate with that. Like, we had that coach, we had that teacher, and you want to do that. Uh, but then life comes along, and you're like, ooh, I need to make some money. Uh, so, so the <laughs> mind shifted, and I, I went to college, and was a, a international business major, double minor in global logistics and Japanese, and got to the end of my first year, and I was like, hmm, yeah, no, this isn't this isn't what I want to do. Uh, so I went back and, and made that choice of what is my passion. My passion was teaching because I had some great teachers, uh, great teachers and great coaches, and and went along with that. That is unbelievable. That's exactly what I wanted to major in: international business and Japanese. <laughs> um, so what was the turning point? Uh, what, what made you depart from your mental map to the one you're on now? Yeah, I, so a little bit about my, my kind of testimony coming to Christ. I came to Christ at a younger age, probably 10 or 11 years old. I remember going to a conference with my mom, and, and that is that defining moment where I knew that there was something more. Um, but then we have those teenage years where it's we're going to do our own thing. We have those, those young adult years where we're half in, half out. We're lukewarm. Uh, but I would say really the, the turning point and a couple key people, uh, my wife's grandmother who attended here for years, uh, my grandmother, my mom, and then my wife. Um, so just that team of people um, really being that encouragement that, that it's okay to step in and, and be fully in and not half in, half out. Uh, so that was probably the turning point after my freshman year. Me and my wife kind of started attending a church, and um, that was the turning point. It was not looking back anymore in, in that old life and really, mm -hmm. no, th this, is, this is what I want because you just feel you're, you're not half empty anymore. You're, everything is always half full because uh, you know you have Christ to look forward to. Amen. So is it safe to say, Brandon, you know who you are? Oh, no doubt. And, and that's probably if, if you know Jane Waite, um, her biggest saying, and Hannah hated it, was always remember who you are and who's you are. Hannah, mm. to, to this day, she would tell you, until she was probably 22 or 23, hated it. Uh, but now that she gets it. Mm. We all get it. It's not who our families want us to be. It's we belong to Jesus, and, and we know who we are in Christ. Amen. Man, thank you so much. for Brandon is one reason. <laughs> Brandon's one, one reason I'm so excited about the future of this church as, as just one of many young leaders we have here. So thank you. Know who you are, wherever you are, if you are. Can you put that next football player on the screen for me? This is a while before. Um, uh, this is Reggie White. Reggie White was a defensive end, all pro several years, also a Super Bowl champ. At one point, unblockable. You could not block him. He, was, he struck fear in the hearts of every quarterback that faced his team in his day. I saw a very similar interview with him late in his career, right before he retired, and the same type of line of questioning. Man, you've done about everything. You hit the Pro Bowl. You've won a Super Bowl. You've you got a lot of money coming in. You've got a great family and all like that. And the question was, how do you want to be remembered when it's all over? And he, without flinching, he looked right into the camera, and he said, I want to be known as a man of God. 
I want to be known as a man of God. So as we move to the third great truth, my question for you and me is, what, do you, what stories do you want your grandkids to tell about you? That he got to be executive vice president of some company, that he made a million dollars, that he, he loved his favorite drink of scotch, that he was a scratch golfer, all those, that was great stuff. But to be a man of God, I think, is the highest. So the third great truth comes from verse 12. The greater the emptiness, the greater the urgency. We see a lot of people running as hard as they can in the wrong direction these days, don't we? And then they get to the end of that and like, whoop, that wasn't it. And they back up and they go in another wrong direction as hard as they can until that explodes around them too. Verse 12, Peter is running toward the tomb. He doesn't know what he's going to find, but he's like, all of a sudden, there's a shred of hope that maybe his life is not over. Maybe there's something redeemable. If the grave is empty and he actually is back from the grave, maybe there is hope there, and he does that. Um, it says that he came back and, and was wondering. That word wondering means highly surprised, amazed, borderline admiration. He's probably walking back saying, why would I think the death of Jesus was predictable? Nothing else was predictable about him. He kept us on edge for three years. I should have known. I should have known. And he went on to become a great servant of God. This is the if, y'all. If you have a relationship with Jesus that is something you can identify, it's from an experience you know he's in here, you know he's in your life, I'm not talking about coming to church. I'm not talking about occasionally cracking open your Bible. Those are great things, and they're necessary. I'm not talking about going somewhere and taking communion. That's great, too. I'm talking about do you know in here his spirit is in you, and do you know that you're aware of his presence in you? That has a beginning point. It did with Brandon, and it did with me, and it makes all the difference in the world. Can you put that last picture up there, guys, the last photograph? Thank you. This is a fellow you may not know. I did not. Renard Bertram is, was his name. He was French gendarme. He was a lieutenant colonel in 2018, a terrorist. Goes into Paris and holds some people hostage. He kills a couple of people. He finally, systematically, through a couple of days, he releases all the hostages except one. Lieutenant Colonel Betram was part of the negotiation team. At one point, Betram tells this, this terrorist who's already killed, he said, I tell you what, life for a life. You can have my life as a hostage if you'll let her go. And the hostage, for whatever reason, complied. Three hours later, three shots rang out, and Betram was dead. He literally gave his life for someone he did not know. Now, as heroic as that is, that does not come close to holding a candle to what we celebrate today because that hostage went on to live her mental map. She may have may not been eternity bound. She may have been in a relationship with Christ. We don't know. But there was nothing Betram could do about that part. All he could do was save her and delay death physically for her. Jesus comes onto the scene. His death was not as a martyr. His death was, I'm giving it up willingly because my blood is pure and it will atone, it will make retribution for all of your sins. And if you claim that and confess it and repent for me, ask for forgiveness before me, I will come into your life and you will have a brand new mental map that was constructed for you from the beginning of time. There is no other plan. That's plan A and B and C, and there is no other one. And that is what we are advocating this morning. Be who you are, wherever you are, if you are. Make sure of the if, and the who and the where will work out. So. Let me, let me try to illustrate it one more way. Thank you, Eddie. Here's what we see going on around a, a lot today. Here's you, let's say. 
here's God. And if you believe that God exists, you believe he's creator. It's like, how do I have a relationship with God? I'm busted, I'm broken, I'm living my own mental map. He's God, he's perfect, he's holy, he's beyond comprehension, he's sovereign, he's in heaven, total miss. I don't know how in the world I can ever get there. There had to be a provision. Unless somebody comes out of heaven, lives as a human, fully human and fully divine, we have no plan. But with this, Jesus actually reaches out to us. That's what the cross was all about. He reaches to us when we simply say, yes, I surrender by faith my life to you. We come into that relationship with Jesus. His spirit comes and lives in us. And then guess what? We have made a new mental map here, but it gets us where we need to be. And that is relationship with God. Has to be through Jesus, though. It's not over here. Watch this. At that point, we can go back into knowing who we are, where we are, and then as we go out into this world, we're not walking by our plans or our map. We're following his. So the guarantee is you stay close to me, we'll figure it out together, and I will bear fruit. I will multiply your life to the people that matter the most to you. And then we come full circle. The majority of us right now are living an incomplete circle, and we don't know how to close the circle up. That's what I'm offering to you. You know, lives change with one conversation. Ideas have changed the world. The greatest idea in the world is Jesus coming in the form of fully God and fully man, perfect son of God. The greatest conversation is when he says, I just need your confession and I just need your surrender. That's called a prayer. We'd love to pray for you for that at the tent or down front here. As I said, we always have an invitation time. That's for everybody, for anybody to simply come forward and say, I need Jesus. I need to take the next step. I'm not sure what it is. We'll talk about that later. I need a church home. I need the fellowship and the strength and the growth in numbers or whatever that need is in your life. Don't hesitate. You're among friends. If you can't quite get to an aisle easily today in this big crowd, we got the tent out front. We can talk about the same things at the tent out front. Why don't you stand as Eddie comes and leads us, and let me pray for you. And um, for those of you that would like, we'll see you down front. Father, we, we are incomplete. We will never close the circle until we truly, truly give our lives and our maps to you. So, God, would you just uh, allow us the surrender to be courageous enough to admit that we are messed up. We do have gaps. We do have a very incomplete, futile map. And, God, do your great work in us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.